they're waiting to get tested or they're waiting to go to CAT scan, you start antibiotics. The question is not get an LP first. If there are hours and hours and hours have passed, then give antibiotics and screw the LP um, because the person's going to die. And that's, you know, you make your ID practitioner happy, happy to get your culture, but then your patient is dead and the consult is useless. So um, uh, if you have an option to use a beta-lactam, use it. Um, beta-lactams have the best uh, penetration of the blood-brain barrier um, for um, meningitis purposes. Um, empirical therapy, this would be a very reasonable question to ask on the board. It's high-dose ceftriaxone, so two grams, although you don't need to know doses, two grams uh, and uh, with vank. Why is the vank there? Exactly. So, so cephalosporin and penicillin resistant strep pneumo, perfect. Mm. Which I included for you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I should read my slides more carefully. Um, so if they're over age, age 50, add AMP. Um, the question of whether or not to add GENT is sort of up in the air. If it's an old person with good kidneys, add GENT. If it's an old person with bad kidneys, don't. Okay. Um, and the only scenario, we get this question a lot, um, is should we add steroids for this person? The only indication for meningitis with steroids is pneumococcal meningitis. That's it. Any other agent, no steroids. Um, uh, renal cerebral zygomycosis, which is not mucormycosis. Uh, uh, the terminology is now zygomycosis or zygomycosis. Um, think about this in somebody who's hyperglycemic, diabetic, presenting with HHS or DKA. Um, classically, they will have an acute sinusitis at presentation, so they'll have some um, edema or swelling or they'll have nasal congestion they're complaining of. They may have bloody nasal discharge, it may just be purulent. Um, uh, they may develop uh, periorbital or facial swelling as well. Um, uh, if, they have, if they start picking off cranial nerves, really bad things are happening, which is sort of obvious. Um, uh, but Realize that aspergillus, aspergillus shows up a lot on the boards just because people think about aspergillus doing all kinds of random stuff. Um, aspergillus is not a zygomyce. So if they give you options, go with rhizopus, not uh, aspergillus. Although I, I don't think that they would give you op many options uh, about bug names on the boards. Um, the, the physical findings that you see when you see the black patches or that mucosal darkening, that's not the mold, that's vasoinvasion causing infarction. So the, all of these agents are vasoinvasive um, and they cause tissue destruction. And then the, the fungus itself is opportunistic, so they're essentially saprophytes. They'll grow, go in and start growing on the dead material. Um, but, um, and the treatment is, uh, ID is adjunctive to this. So you send them to the operating room, otherwise they'll die. Okay, question about CNS stuff? So I put the Duke criteria up here just because I'm supposed to. Do not memorize the Duke criteria for the boards. There's no point. <laughs> Some things that are important, though, is the relationship between strep bovis and colon cancer. So if you have somebody who, who presents with endocarditis, 65, 70-year-old person presenting with endocarditis of an unexplained cause, hasn't had dental procedure, hasn't had anything, um, and they, the lab identifies it as bovis, the next step is colonoscopy. That's the right answer for the boards. And that's a very, actually, common like, boards question, um, both for internal medicine and ID, actually. Um, and um, reasons that you might want to send somebody to the operating room, this question um, is somewhat controversial, although it's in print, and the American College of Cardiology and the IDSA both agree on these being the, the criteria for early surgery. It's the cardiothoracic folks that don't seem to appreciate that same literature. But if you have persistent um, vegetation despite systemic embolization, so you have a Goomba, it's flicking around, it gets thrown off, and yet on repeat echo after their stroke, they still have a Goomba, that's probably a reason to go to the operating room, especially if it's a large enough vegetation. Um, if you have multiple embolic events uh, within uh, the first couple of weeks of antibiotic therapy, that's a reason to, to go think about operating room. Um, Certainly acute valvular loss, um, uh, dehiscence or uh, uh, periannular um, uh, abscess, uh, uh, ring abscess would all, all be reasons, heart block, um, all be reasons to, to go to the operating room. Um, I put these up here. I don't have stars on these, but these are the official kind of durations for, treat, for treating different bugs. 
Um, I'm going to actually skip to the slide that summarizes things, which is this one. So don't memorize the Duke criteria. It just sort of makes sense when you think about um, things. And they're not going to ask you, does this person have you know, the Duke criteria endocarditis? Um, in general, gentamicin is used uh, as, a re um, as an adjunct in regimens to, to help with weak bugs. And it shortens the duration of therapy. So you can go from six weeks, uh, so from four weeks to two, from six weeks to four. Um, but then uh, certain bugs like Enterococcus, uh, you have to use Gent the entire time. You can't shorten it um, uh, because it's a special bug. So Gent, Enterococcus requires Gent the entire course. Prosthetic valves, no matter what the bug is, it's always six weeks. There's no shortening of treatment, even if they're on good behavior and they have a weakling bug, it's still six weeks of treatment. And staphylococcus is always six weeks, no matter what it is. If it's ORSA or OSSA, it's still six weeks. OK. Uh, intravascular infections. So um, uh, staph aureus and salmonella, um, uh, you can get uh, aortic aneurysms and mycotic aneurysms from both of those bugs. So um, that's a, um, think about something, somebody like that, if they have a known AAA or a known aortic aneurysm, and they have a high-grade bacteremia, meaning a persistent bacteremia, despite early intervention or early therapy. Um, uh, and it's, it's usually somebody without endovascular material, so it's somebody who's not been operized before. Um, they, they have these high-grade bacteremia. So think about that as a, a possible relationship. Um, and then syphilis, um, it, it, just remember that um, it can be a cause of aortic regurgitation. So if you get, you get aortic root dilatation, as a function of syphilis, and it can cause valve. Um, uh, you can get regurg. Uh, RMSF, of which you guys should be um, uh, overly familiar. Um, um, the again, treatment with doxycycline, um, and there's no good diagnostic tool. So it's not that we're hiding anything from you. There really is no crap. It's really crappy diagnostic tools for this. I wish there was something better, but there isn't. So if you have a picture like this. Uh, and it wouldn't be unreasonable. Enough of the country is affected by, by RMSF um, that uh, it would appear on the boards. And certainly there are regional questions like histoplasmosis treatment that would turn up on your boards, um, and RMSF would show up in somebody that's not in an RMSF endemic part of the country. Um, respiratory tract infections, so community acquired pneumonias, this also should be sort of um, back of your hand, hopefully by now. Um, but um, the most common bugs to worry about, strep pneumo. The reason we vaccinate is not to prevent pneumonia, it's to prevent invasive disease. Um, uh, so uh, prevent uh, bacteremias or meningitis once you get a pneumonia with strep pneumo. Uh, mycoplasma or walking pneumonia, H. flu, um, uh respiratory viruses, Legionella. Uh, the breakdowns here are, they sort of follow the, the scheme of the port score of whether or not this person deserves hospital admission and at their ICU level or if they uh, are or aren't ICU level. If they're outpatient, this is, I mean, you kind of know this already, but um, a macrolide or doxycycline would be reasonable. People often overlook doxycycline, but it actually is excellent for pneumonia coverage. Um, uh, everybody just gets Z-packs because they're easy. If they have comorbidities, a respiratory fluoroquinolone, or um, uh, sort of mimicking what you would do with an inpatient with a beta-lactam plus a macrolide is very reasonable. So an oral, uh, you know, cefuroxime and azithromycin, cefuroxime and doxy, something of that nature. Um, somebody who's inpatient but not ICU bound, um, a quinolone or uh, cetraxone azithro. Um, if they're ICU level, kind of the same rules apply, but then you have to start adding on additional therapy. So um, uh, you have to also consider uh, whether or not you need pseudomonas coverage. Um, and remember um, that erdipenem of the, so you, you can use a carbapenem here, and they're actually very nice and easy to use, except that erda does not kill pseudomonas. So that's an important hole in the curve of penalties. Um, Emmy, Miro, and Dory all would be re uh, reasonable coverage. Um, and there's, there's some debate uh, still ongoing about whether or not linazolid is better than vancomycin for ORSA or MRSA pneumonia or for, for uh, sensitive staph pneumonias. The jury is out, so they're not going to ask you which one is better, but you can use either one. Some people feel relatively strongly that linazolid is better. I'm not one of those people. Um, uh, uh, HCAP and VAP, um, uh, again, the bugs that you've run into in the unit, so Pseudomonas, E. coli, Cleb, um, Azonidobacter. Um, 
these are the, the indications, sort of the official indications for being a high-risk person. And realize that your training has sort of poisoned you into thinking that everybody needs these drugs. So on the boards, they will give you a person who has none of these. And they'll want you to, to snap at it and put them on, you know, broad spectrum stuff when they could get away with more, much less coverage. So um, if they are clearly somebody who has no risk factors at all and has a community acquired process, then don't be afraid to, to give um, a, a kind of pulled back therapy. It's okay. Um, uh, and, you know, it seems sort of crazy here, but um, for half or, or that, if there are no known risk factors, you can do something like ertapenem or ceftriaxone, which seems crazy, well, seems crazy to me, just because of seeing the people that I see. But um, it is reasonable for purposes of the board. Um, and also remember, not dapamycin for pneumonia, so why not dapo? What's dapo? Yeah, so it gets, uh, it's got a big long tail and it gets bound up in surfactant, so it doesn't make it into the alveoli. It was a big study that, that was trying to get an indication for that, and people started dying, and they said, I wonder what's happening. Okay, some more um, uh, weird uh, bugs that you should think about um, in the right kind of person, so uh, BMT or, or solid organ recipient, no cardia. Um, if you get a, a report back to the lab that says there's this filamentous or beaded appearance, um, that's the, the, the buzzword for nocardia, it may be acid fast, so sometimes it'll cause a little bit of buzz at first, that this might be TB, and then they give a better report that says it's actually beaded, um, or it's branching and filamentous looking, and then that doesn't, it's not TB. Um, the incidence of nocardia has dropped a lot because of Bactrim. So, um, uh, most of the species of nocardia are sensitive in some degree to Bactrim, um, and so the, the, um, uh, the making that routine uh, part of um, prophylaxis has reduced the incidence of nocardia. So we see this now in people that are sulfa-allergic. Um, we see it, um, uh, we don't see a huge amount of nocardia actually, but uh, when we do, um, this is the, the thing that you need to think about, is getting a, a scan of the head. So nocardia metastasizes. It loves to go from lung to brain. So you can have brain abscess and lung abscess at the same time as nocardia. Typically a cavitary lesion. Um, the head lesion may or may not be uh, particularly big. Um, usually it's a single lesion, but they can be multiple. Um, Aspergillus, um, uh, the crescent sign or the halo sign on the chest CT is the buzzword for that. Um, uh, Ampho B is the, is the uh, uh, treatment of choice uh, if you're given an option for aspergillus up front. Um, and I, I did not go into the oncologic prophylaxis part, um, uh, um, but there is some, you know, obviously you don't use Ampho for prophylaxis, but use of um, uh, voriconazole and posiconazole has been shown to be efficacious in all patients for prophylaxis. Um, and the pneumocystis, uh, um, it's, it is an HIV-associated disease, but you also see it in transplant folks, and you see it in people who've received fludarabine as part of chemo, because fludarabine makes you CD4 chemic for up to two years after you get it. So um, uh, those people are at risk, and, and they warrant prophylaxis, actually, for um, pneumocystis with something. Um, classically, non-productive cloth um, uh, that's kind of insidious, shortness of breath. Steroids are applied if your PAOC is less than 70. Um, Pentamidine, you can give it IV, that's second line treatment. You should, you should know Bactrim is the first line. Pentamidine is second line. And you can do inhale, but it's only for prophylaxis. You cannot treat pneumocystis uh, with inhaled pentamidine. Um, and that was actually on the IV boards as an option to give an inhaled pentamidine. Um, TB, this is painful, but you have to memorize this. So this, this will be on the boards in some fashion. Um, and the most important thing to know is that your threshold is 10 millimeters. So that question of, um, you know, somebody, a coworker, a colleague, a nurse in your facility, blah, 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 is a 10 millimeter uh, PPD, what do you do? Um, the threshold for healthcare, because of our exposures, is 10. Um, five, if somebody has severe immune compromise, or if they have evidence that they've had TB in the past in some form, or if they have any kind of abnormality on the chest X-ray at all. Um, it drops the threshold to five. Um, Fifteen is for everybody who has uh, no uh, identifiable TB risk factor. Okay. 
Um, and then also, this is uh, kind of important, is I give you the option to do an 